uh, it's all anointed if he's in it. But for me, I tend to like the less produced things. I mean, I find what gets me in touch with God better is stuff that's not as produced. Now, I totally love producing the big orchestral things. I dig that, but I, I really sort of feel like uh, if you're really talking about getting people in touch with God, it's like the most beautiful, pure way to do that is to kind of like sit down cross-legged on the floor with your acoustic guitar and just disappear, you know? So in, in some ways, you know, we, we kind of got shoved toward that orchestral thing, which w was cool we at the time. kind of pushed that direction uh, in, in, well, I shouldn't say push that direction, but, you know, because there was really no... Kind of musical, you know, it was all pretty low key production for worship back then. You know, we we started going for the huge grandeur and and the the whole orchestral thing, but uh, which was great at the time. I mean, it, it's it's interesting how we're doing an album overseas that they specifically wanted me to to go back after that kind of sound, but. Uh, you know, at, at the time, I think it was impactful just because nobody was used to hearing worship on that grand a scale. You know, the only worship they knew was sort of really not well recorded, uh, you know, acoustic guitar. That, that was it. Well, and I'm sure for many churches that were small and didn't have the means to manufacture that type of worship, it was a new genre to them altogether because unless you attended yeah. uh, a large church with an orchestra and a, and a program, which uh, even at the time, those were budding things that didn't oh, it exist in even large churches at the time, you know, that would have right. been uh, something new for them. So that, that's really interesting. Um, what were some of the struggles that you faced as producer and arranger in those early years? Like obviously you're on a timetable. Table. I can't imagine the 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 pressure of every eight weeks churning out something. And it's got to be fresh. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, it's so funny. I I just I don't remember anything as as a as as a challenge. I mean, it it, it was all um, it was exciting. You know, it, there there was there was never a time. You know, every time we run into the next thing, it was like, okay, God, you know, I know you were faithful there here, and I know you were faithful there, and I remember when you, you totally bailed us out here. But God, are you sure about this next one? And you know, He would just show Himself strong again. So, I mean, it was very much much a, a, a faith journey. You know, every time we would, uh, you know, stretch out into waters, it just seemed like ridiculous. You know. We're just like little kids, man. We're we're running out and saying, "Well, why can't we rent an auditorium? You know, why can't we, you know, go and record in Africa?" Uh, and every time we would do it, you know, and people would say, "Are you nuts?" You know, and we would say, "Probably," you know. But you know, our God's an awesome God, and He would somehow make it happen. So, I mean, just the way my brain works, I don't remember anything as a as a problem per se. You know, and just everything that, you know, the enemy threw in our way, God just kind of trampled all over. So, um, you know, I suppose there was, uh, I stayed up a lot of late nights, let's put it that way. But uh, I always had energy to do it, and I always felt God support me. So it, it was never, it was never anything but fun. <laughs> How were new songs scouted out and added to the Integrity Catalog? Whose job was that? How did that How did that come about? I know in the early days, sometimes you pull from the Scripture and Song Catalog and what Dave and Dale Garrett were doing out in New Zealand, and right, they yeah. come from other places. Talk to me a little bit about how the whole copyright catalog of Integrity was developed. Yeah. Well, in the early days, it was just like the worship leaders. I mean, you know, the four of us would sit down, and it's like, well... You know, what have you heard? What have you heard? And, and normally we would have that meeting with the next worship leader as well. So, uh, you know, you basically got five guys who are from five different churches, five different backgrounds, all kind of feeding in. And, you know, we would aim for about, you know, 10 to 12 to 14 songs on an album. So you can imagine, you know, there's these slots up on the whiteboard in my living room, right? And, uh, you know, so out of those five guys, usually in that first meeting, maybe 
you know, four or five of those slots. In other words, the worship leader comes with a song that's like really moving in his church, or maybe a couple of songs that he's written. And, uh, you know, I'd have something that, you know, that is really, really living and breathing in our church. And, uh, you know, we would, you know, Don had just come from a conference and he heard this new song, you know, and Mike was just traveling in Australia and he heard. So, uh, you know, we would bring those together and come up with about half of them. And then everybody's job was to, like, go away and just search our community of songwriters. So uh, we began to develop just this network of songwriters, guys like Paul DeLosh and Ed Carr and Linda Shazo and Lenny LeBlanc. And uh, these were all just people that we knew, friends that we knew. And, and, you know, as soon as we started making relationships with Maranatha, the people out here in California, that opened up a whole new bunch of songwriters like Walt Hera and Tommy Coombs and, uh, you know, all the great songwriters that are associated with that world. And um, When the Garretts, you know, came to visit our church, you know, we were exposed to the whole scripture and song catalog, and that was a whole new flavor of stuff. So it, it wasn't really scientific in the early days. It was basically just sitting down and saying, you know, what's God putting in our hands? You know, that's probably what we ought to be putting on the records. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to look because not all the time were they necessarily brand new songs. Like I, I know songs like Ah Lord God and even All Hail King Jesus. I think their copyright is the late 70s or the early 80s, even before Integrity yeah. had formed. So w would you say that there was an element of uh, not only looking for new songs, but looking for songs that were just frankly working in churches and that the Lord was totally. using? Totally. I mean, the whole the whole concept was... Nobody wanted to be a record company. Basically, we, we looked at ourselves as, we want to chronicle what God is doing in these churches. You know, it's not like no, nobody ever wanted to invent a record company or, or, or invent a record. Basically, we just wanted to go out and be like a reporter. You know, we're going to bring our recorders, we're going to bring our camera into this church and just chronicle what's going on here in Miami, what's going on here in Cape Town, what's going on here in in Seoul, South Korea, and and spread that to the rest of the world. So, like, you know, you can have richer worship if you sort of, like, check out what they're doing here and incorporate that into your community and vice versa. So the whole idea was just to capture and record and, like, cross-pollinate the church to make worship richer. So a lot of those older songs were just songs that my pastor was... I don't know where he came up with a lot of this stuff. They're just songs that were passed from... Uh, you know, I mean, sometimes we even got them wrong. I mean, we killed a couple of songs because when my pastor came from the conference, you know, he would sing it to me wrong, you know, and then we would publish it wrong and, and find out later, that's not the way the guy wrote it. But then everybody started singing it that way. And it's like, ah, what have we done? Man? But uh, I mean, obviously later it got a little bit more scientific, but in the early days it was totally... It's interesting. One thing I did notice, too, is how the songs that you guys would use would sometimes further affirm how God would use uh, or anoint specific artist songs. Like, I'm thinking of uh, Twyla Paris and her album Kingdom Seekers in 1985. It had He Is Exalted on it and yeah. Lamb of God. Great uh, two, two great songs that Hosanna Integrity probably helped get into the church or at least further affirmed their place in the church hymnody. Um, right. you know, herself being an artist and you know today we have artists that cut worship songs all the time and we'll we'll go ahead and we'll use them in church but back in the 80s um, you know you <laughs> it, it necessarily wouldn't happen you may have somebody that would buy a, a cassette track right and sing it as a special but now you have this company that's affirming and saying hey these songs are palatable maybe even in more congregationally friendly keys here they are now in a congregational setting for you to use and it's interesting I know those early right. albums Ken Henry cut he is exalted and I think Lamb of God was later cut um, by, yeah. by you guys as well. And it's just neat to see how it just appears like the Lord would use the company and integrity to affirm, uh, you know, how he was using right. songs by artists. Would that be a correct assertion? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we, we would look at, uh, at look at all those songs. And, you know, it's interesting to look at where we are now. Uh, I mean, I think what you guys are doing is so important just so that Christians can stay on track. Because... Uh, back then, it's like, if somebody can use this song as a tool to connect with God, it's a worship song. It doesn't matter if it comes from a Christian artist, not a worship leader. It doesn't matter 
uh, if it's a tool that God can use, then it, it belongs in worship. So, like, the ability of a person to sing it was key to us. That, that's something that we were very much looking for. That's not to say that a more complicated, you know, not congregational song isn't a totally valid expression. You know, you can get totally inspired by listening to somebody sing a, a solo song that a congregation can never do. So there's a place for both. But, uh, you know, it sort of seems like now, you know, I, I hate generalizations, but, like, there's a tendency now for uh, what we call worship to be sort of like a Christian concert little segment in the service, you know, because the songs are not the sort of thing that congregations can sing as easily, mm. and therefore their tendency, and the production is becoming like awesome, which is a good thing, but if the production is that awesome, and the vocal is that overwhelming, and it's not really anything that the people can pick up and sing, the tendency is, well, you know, we should just let these guys perform, and let's just dig it, and then we'll just clap at the end. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of, I don't want to say a lot, but, but there's a tendency to kind of lean that way. So it's like Sunday morning rock show, and as far as people entering into worship and forgetting about what's going on here and connecting with God, I think that may be happening a little less, I, which I, is, I, yeah. yeah, so, I would, so I, I, I think what you're doing here is going to serve to help people see, okay, like, you see what this cycle is doing? So let's get back to the place in the cycle where we're really connecting with God and not sort of get duped into this thing of, uh, what do you mean? It sounds great. It looks great. We've got light show. We've got fog. We've got high tech. We've got this. And God is kind of going, well, eh? Really? Yeah, you guys are pretty cool, but what about me? You know. You know, in terms of uh, in terms of songwriting and how that plays into songwriting, I, I think you make a very valid point. In fact, one of my colleagues and one of my bosses that I work with is is Don Marsh, as you as you know, a very yeah. very uh -huh. well accomplished right. arranger and composer. And yeah. um, I can remember sitting in a listening meeting with him recently at our publishing company and said, "Man, if this if this artist put a, as much time into crafting his lyric and melody as he did to the production." This song could stick to the wall, <laughs> and I think that's indicative of of what we're up against. I think in yeah. this generation is that the you know you listen to the content of what is on the radio, and I, I'm reminded of uh, the theologian Francis Schaeffer. He always said that if you want to get an idea of where a culture is at, listen to the media content. And you got you know yeah. Kelly, Kelly Clarkson coming out with a single, "My Life Would Suck Without You." I'm like, is that the best we can do in terms <laughs> of a lyric? But it's a, re it's a reflection of culture, and as Christians, we're called yeah. to something better, and I think, um, I think that we, we ought to be giving ourselves over to, to our craft, but also, like you're saying, to, um, to really hone in on God's anointing and to allow our songs to come out of um, the depth of our relationship with Him. And, and so, you, look, you look at the songs that are standing the test of time, you look at the How Great Is Our Gods, the Shout to the Lords, the He Is Exalted, yeah. the We Will Glorifies, they, they stick yeah. to the wall, they're in the hymn book, because right. they have some common char technical characteristics, they're singable, like we were talking about. But God's anointing is on them as well. Yeah, so no it seems question to, about it. To be that combination of both, and I, I really, I really appreciate you making mention of that. One other, one other quick question about um, about copyrights, and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure that this must have been the case. But were there any some any great stories about having to hunt down copyrights, not knowing who actually wrote something, and where, where, where do we go to find this, and how do we oh, know yeah. that's right? Any, any songs that come to mind that were, you know, that have a story behind them, or... Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's, there's a couple of great ones. I have to, I have to interject this, based on what you were saying just before, on the, on the break there, when the, when the Skype quit, uh, Rick Warren uh, sent me this, uh, this, this is fine, I didn't realize this, 491 years ago today, Luther, Martin Luther, I, I guess today, because he just sent this out, uh, Martin Luther burned the Pope's demand that he recant or be excommunicated. Wow. And, and, and you think about, you know, like, okay, think about the Lutherans, and you think of what the Lutherans represent today. But, like, Martin Luther, okay, so he gets a thing from the Pope, from the, you know, God's authority supposedly on earth, I mean, you talk about a rebellious guy. I mean, this guy had to be, like, 
you know, he was the he was the Chris Tomlin. He was the Israel Houghton of his day. He was like the Christian revolutionary rock star of his day. I'm sure.